to the Calm Down Podcast. This is episode two, two, three, 223 of the Compound Podcast brought to you by Parse Rum. I love Parse. You love Parse. Go to Benny's. Get your Parse Rum. It is about the time of year where it's switching from the three-year and pina coladas to the eight, 12-year little sipping, little sipping. That's what this sitting time around, is. Sitting around the fire? Who knows? A I don't sip, know. A little sipping time. Uh, parse rum, go to Benny's, get your parse at Benny's. Lots to talk about. Lot to talk about. I'm going to start with the Yankees. I want to talk about the Yankees and maybe not what you think about the Yankees as Tom has his hat and his shirt on. John Carlos Stanton, 10 seasons with 25 plus homers. I don't think we're appreciating that enough. I don't think the world is appreciating that enough. I'll be honest. I had no clue that many. Like, that is pretty wild. I forget how long, like, he was in um, Miami when they were, like, the Florida Marlins, wasn't he? Or not that he, far back? I, I was watching some TikTok highlights of him the other night when he was Mike. I think they were they were specifically just Mike Stanton highlights, uh, yeah. which I think his first two seasons. And I hadn't seen that old Florida stadium in like a couple of years. And I was like, Oh man, this old Florida stadium. Like he was hitting some just tanks at that old Florida stadium into the upper deck when no one was there. He, he got to the big league in 2010 for the Florida oh Marlins. God. He played his first two years for the Florida Marlins. 22 pumps his first year in a hundred games, 34, 37, 24, 37, 27, 27, 59, 38, then three and four, two years he was hurt, and then 35, 31, 24, 25. So he's had 10 seasons of 25 plus, but he's had three other seasons of 22, 24, and 24. So, it, you know, he's got 427 homers. He's got over 1,000 RBIs. He's one of the most prolific power hitters of the generation. And, like, it's a five time All Star. It's an impressive career. And I, I just don't think he's appreciated. He's got an 800 OPS with a 121 OPS plus this year. Like, it's not kind of appreciated enough just how good he's been for how long. I was going to say a 136 career OPS plus is wild. Like, other than last year, he's, like, religiously, like, 130 to 150 in OPS plus. Like, the dude just drives the baseball. Yeah, he does. I mean, he, is wild. he's been a really, really good hitter for a long time, and it's He's got an MVP, got a couple silver sluggers. Like it's he's one of the most unique players to watch because when he's going well and he, he has that swing that looks so good, when he's going well, you go, How does anyone get this guy out? Because he hits the ball so hard, he can cover the whole plate, and he just just demolishes every baseball. But then he'll he's had some stretches in the last couple of years where you go, How did this guy ever get a hit? Because he also swings so hard you know, chases a lot of pitches. He's, he's been a very interesting Yankee to watch. I think a lot of people here are frustrated with him, but I think you're right. And I think especially this year when the team is so desperately in the need of a third guy, the, when he's come back, he's been very valuable for them this year. And like a 121 OPS plus is not something to sneeze at. And, and the fact that he has another 25 home run season, they're going to need him in the playoffs. He's going to be, it's going to be him and Wells are like the two key guys for them down the stretch and in the playoffs. If they're going to have success, they're going to, they're going to, it's going to be teams are not going to let judge and Soto beat them as much as they can. The thing is the Yankees still have like the names that could like produce and like be that third, fourth guy. Like you have judge and Soto, but then like Volpe could be the guy jazz could be the guy Verdugo could be the guy. Like you have the multiple, <laughs> don't shake your head. He could be, I'm saying there's multiple options that like could step up. It's not like, they're rolling out like a bunch of just like whatever players like the rest of their lineup still has a ton of talent. Listen, you need someone to hit a ground ball to second and <laughs> Verdugo's your guy, that guy, Stop. no one better Stop. than hitting ground balls to second. I, I will never forget when we went to New York for the first time and Stanton hit a home run over my head at like 120 miles an hour. It was the loudest, hardest hit ball I've ever seen in person. And I was just like, Oh my god. He hits the ball so hard. It's an it's absolute so rock. He is strong. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to say that about Stan. It's impressive. And we're playing right now against McCutcheon. And 
you know, he's 37, I think he'll be 38 after the year, like 300 plus homers. His career that he's put together is super impressive. Like the longevity, the ability, he's still doing it, man. He's still hitting. He's got, he's got a 750 OPS or something like that. And like, I was looking at his career numbers today and like, it's an impressive career and he's still, he's still doing it. I mean, he's got 18, he's got 18 pumps. He's got a 758 OPS, 110 OPS plus. He's got a 127 career. That's good. 831 OPS, 127 OPS plus career. Like he's had an amazing career too. And it's just. Maybe, maybe we don't, maybe we don't fluff a guy that hit a game winning homer against you guys yesterday. Though. You know, maybe, maybe we, maybe we tear him down a little bit for now. Just appreciate his career, man. Just appreciate That's his fair. career. That's you all. can appreciate it after this series is over. You don't yeah. have to yell at me. You don't have to yell at me. No, but I was getting excited about our Cubbies. Let's stay on the Yankees. Let's stay in the Yankees. Sorry, sorry, sorry. September 1st rolls around. They bring back Riz. Riz is back. He's in the lineup. It's good to see. Goes two before the first game. We love to see it. He's back. And you know who else is back? Our boy Scott Yafros is back in the show. After a long road, after uh, rehabbing and a lot of time in Tampa, Scotty Efros is back in the big leagues. Him and Riz are going to be in Chicago uh, this weekend, and I'm very excited to see both of them. Do you, if you hang out with Rizzo and don't hang out with Scotty, you'd break his heart. So just, just know that. Like you need to hang out with both of them. I will see both. Like Rizzo, Rizzo's going to be tied up. No, no, uh, not he's, for he's, he's gonna, have, he's gonna have a lot of people. Yeah, bro, guy. it's gonna be a lot. Are you getting like dinner with him? Like, do you have plans already? I might have plans. Yeah. Are they coming there for the off day? Do you know or no? Or do they are they not off on Thursday? They're off on Thursday. They have to be here for the off day. I mean, there's yeah, they're coming from Texas. They got to be here. That's perfect. That's yeah. so sick. What a treat! Yeah, it's I gonna think... be cool. You guys golfing? Are you hmm? golfing, Zach? Asked. Are you golfing on Thursday? No, no golfing. You're not either. No, taking the day. Uh, but I I am excited to see the reception for Riz and the video and everything. You know, everybody's come back now. Uh, of all the guys that were on that team, and um, I think Riz will probably, you know, it's a long-awaited reception, and it'll be it'll be pretty special, and it's going to sure. be packed. It's it's been a little light. It was it was good crowd yesterday for Labor Day, but it was a little light today. Get kids are back in school and six forty game times and everything, and it'll be cool to see it packed out for a day game on Friday with Riz back. I don't think That's we can. Gonna... I don't think we can gloss over Scotty's comeback. TJ in 22, missed all of 23, then gets back surgery towards the end of 2023, was walking around in Ian's wedding with just a broken back, couldn't sit like down a, for a It was like a week before the seconds. surgery. Yeah, it was like he literally got surgery the week after your wedding. Um, and then like works his way back, gets into rehab games, clears rehab and gets optioned immediately. And then just like to go and shove after that and get the call back up, like really cool to see. Um, so hopefully he goes up there and dominates and we can watch him throw some playoff games. Yeah. Potentially be on a playoff roster. And after all of that and all that, you know, you know we all talked to him through it a little bit and, you know, it was a long road. I think, I mean, two years is crazy being by yourself too. You know, he literally was living by himself too. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. and he, he got a, he had a dog. He rescued a dog when he was down there rehabbing, um, It's a lot, man. It's and for him to kind of, you know, keep his head on straight, you know, for for two years for the the most part. Yeah. You know, there's a few blips here and there. But, you know, um, like when I broke my hand in 19, I missed like three months and I was like, this is horrible. You know, for two two years is a long time. And for like you said, Dakota, to come back, throw well. um, It's been awesome. You know, it's just the Scott that, you know, we know and, and we love Scotty. I think the the underrated part is rehabbing last year because what the timing of when he got hurt basically meant that he was never going to pitch last year. So spending a whole year rehabbing, knowing you have no chance of basically playing in games, and still getting through that. I, I, I he talked a little bit about it, but I can't imagine how mentally challenging that was to basically have your entire year lead up to like two simulated games. That was the entire of what he did last year was to try to get back and pitch in two simulated games, and then to see him on the mound the other day was. You know, they talked about the broadcast. It, it, I, you can't imagine what the last two years were like, and just the fact that he made it back, 
is uh, incredible. And now, the, truthfully, the Yankees need him. I mean, the Yankees are in, in, in need of bullpen help right now. If he pitches well, there will be a role for him in this team and in the playoffs. Uh, so it's as, as Aaron Boone likes to say, it's all in front of him. It's all in front of him. If if the, if he can take it, advantage of the opportunity, the opportunities are there for him right now. That was such a like GM talking to the media answer of like, there's a role for him if like he steps up and can execute. Uh, we we have a spot for him on this team. Like we can use him. It's very professional. I like it. I'm gonna stay on the former Cubby train. Okay. With an exceptional performance brought to you by Bruce Bolt. Bruce Bolt, the betting angles that I use, betting angles that Zach uses. He loves them. I love them. BruceBolt.us. Go check out my gloves, the baby blues, the white with baby blue, the elephant print. All the, you need a leg guard, you need an arm sleeve, you need some hats, you need baseball pants. BruceBolt.us. Our good friend Kyle Schwarber. Oof. Three pumps today. Three He's pumps. Unreal. Game winner late in that game. I think it was top of the ninth. Um. Yes. The Phillies are rolling, and Schwab Daddy is a big part of that. He's got 31 pumps. Does he have, was that before today? Does he have 33 now? No, he has 31 now. He was at 28. Okay. He's got 31 homers. He's got 88 RBIs. Sitting 245. Pretty good. Pretty I think the worst part is viewing good. it from like a starting pitcher of like, normally you get in there, like you got the lead off to start the game. It's like, ah, worst case, like we give up a base knock. Like it's Kyle Schwarber, and you're like, man, it could be one nothing, and I throw one pitch, and that's just that can't be comfortable. I mean, he had an eight, he had an eight thirteen OPS before today, and hit three homers, so that's probably looking like eight thirty, eight thirty, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's exceptional. He continues to do it. It's it's impressive, man. He's thirty, and he's been hurt a little bit this year. He had a couple. I mean, a couple, uh, couple weeks there with a hamstring. I mean, he's got, he's gonna have like a three seventy on base right now from the leadoff spot with thirty pumps. Like that's just that's special stuff. He's gonna walk a hundred times this year. Just he's leading the league in walks. That's good the craziest him. part is how good of an eye he has because he does strike out a fair amount, but he has a great eye. Yeah, I mean, he's led the league in punch the last two years. He's also getting one of at bats at the top of that order, but he walked 126 yes. times last year. It's like, what do you, you know, it's modern baseball, but what do you want out of your leadoff guy? Like last year, he hit 197, hit 197, but he had a 343 on base because he walked 126 times. And like, he's going to have a 370 on base this year. He's going to walk over a hundred times. Like I don't care how many times he strikes out. Like that guy's on base as your leadoff hitter with three seventy, three eighty on base. Like, sign me up. Sign yeah. me up. Don't care what it looks like. Yep. With and that's from one leadoff hitter to another as well. I mean, a hundred and four. Last year he had a hundred and four RBIs out of the leadoff spot. The year before he had ninety four at the leadoff spot. Like that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. A lot of times with a guy on base. Yeah, it's, he's driving himself in all the time too. Like that's. It's crazy production, and, and it's really like that that lineup. Like they stack their best four hitters coming at you right away, and Rumuto's not even in there. But you know, hey, you got Schwarber, Turner, Harper, and Bohm coming at you, and then Cassiano's following up. Right yeah, right, lines. right out of the shoot. It's like that's good luck, and you got to get those guys four or five times a game. They're going to be tough to beat because they got the pitching too. Like they got Wheeler, Nola, um, Sanchez. Like they're gross. That's yeah, going to be. And their bullpen's deep. Yeah, it is. Let me shift from one of the best teams in the National League and go towards the NL wild card. NL wild card race, pretty tight. Pretty tight. Cubbies made a nice run. Uh, we had an eight and one road trip with uh, two sweeps there. Get back in the conversation. It's there's a lot of bases. You guys are banging. Banging 99 runs in 10 games. Is that good? Uh, yeah. but it's, it's you know, crazy. that's part of yeah. When you go through a stretch like we did where the offense wasn't producing, you know, at some point there was going to be an explosion like that. It was nice to get it on a road trip. You know, we, we lost two to the Pirates here to start the series, you know, tough one last night. And then, you know, we good at bats today and some good spots didn't get the big hit, and that happens, but. There's a lot of baseball left and a lot of stuff happens in September. You know, we were up three games or three and a half games, like two weeks left last year. And, you know, 
stuff happens. So just keeping yourself in the conversation and being around that spot where you can make a run at it. You know, we got some good teams. We got the Yankees, we got the Dodgers, we got the Phillies left, but uh, you know, being being in it and having meaningful baseball in September is cool. Zach's face when you said that you have the Yankees and Dodgers and Phillies. Hey. Well, they go, they finish this up the month. Pirates, then they play the Yankees and then go to LA. We go LA, Colorado on a West Coast trip. That's our last week long trip. And then we mm-hmm. have to go to Philly towards the end of the year for three. Um, I think we still Just... have, we have Washington, we have fourth Washington. I want to say we have Cincy right at the end. Somebody else win. in there. Let's just win tomorrow, sweep the Yankees, and then you win the homestand. You're I, a lot, I've been I've been getting a lot of questions about relax, Tom. I've been getting a lot of questions about uh like when you're in it, like oh what, what do you start do you start thinking about like it doesn't change. Like you have to play one game at a time, one series at a time. Like you have to when you when you lose the first two games to Pittsburgh, like you got to go salvage the last game and get out of there, and then move on to the next series. Like it is, it's still one game at a time. Like it doesn't, you can't look at like, oh wow, we got this coming up. This we got to win three or four here. We got to win two, three, and it's like that's you can't do that. I think I've obviously not experienced it at the big league level, but like even in the minors, like if anything, you're just more locked in. Like when your team's like in the hunt, like you just want to win even more. Not that you don't want to win if your team's the Chicago White Sox. Um, but like you're just a little more locked in on every pitch, every play. Like maybe like the manager makes a little different choice of like, hey, this guy's throwing two games in a row, but we need him tonight because we have to win this game. But like the player side of things, like you just go and play baseball still. Like nothing changes, like you said, Ian. Nothing changes. And there's sometimes there's a little bit of there's a little bit of momentum either way. And definitely sometimes the losses feel worse and sometimes the wins feel better but like it doesn't change the way you go about your prep or the way you're gonna attack every day Mm -hmm. Ian you guys faced uh, Paul Skeen tonight I know you faced him a couple times now just your thoughts pretty I mean he's been obviously very impressive considering his pedigree first overall pick last year already started the all-star game this year yeah we've we've gotten him four times so and interestingly, the way the schedule worked out, which they've been doing a little bit more the last couple of years, both times we played Pittsburgh, we had at Pittsburgh another series, and then they came right to Wrigley. So we had that same situation where we just got Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, faced Keller, Jones, and Skeens, played a series, and then back at it, we got Jones, Skeens, and I think we're going to have um, Felder or Falter. Sorry. I think we have Falter tomorrow, but it was kind of up in the air. But, you know, it's worked out that way both times. So the first time was the same thing where we got him and Jones back to back. And it's interesting because you, you know, you end up seeing that guy in such short uh, amount of time. And I think our pitchers have done it a little bit and their pitchers did too, where, we had really good we did a really good job against both of those guys in Pittsburgh and then they kind of changed their mix you know you see them literally their next start and they changed it so like Skeens threw a lot more changeups today a lot less of the fastball um against our lefties and it was a little bit of a different look and he's going to keep adapting he's going he's been so good like he's going to keep adapting and figuring out like what pitches work against different guys in different situations and it's interesting when you face a guy like that back to back, or we faced him four times now this year, which is probably the most he's faced any team. Like it's interesting how the adjustments come and so early. Do you think there's an advantage one way or another hitter or pitcher on like facing the same guy multiple times? Like, I feel like for hitters, like you get more of a feel of like, this is how his changeup moves. This is how his slider moves. I feel like it favors the hitter a little bit. Yeah, I do. I do. I, th- I think when you see a guy multiple times, a starter, you have a better idea of the way the pitchers are going to move and what it's going to look like. I do think like when a pitcher does a good job, like Jones threw a lot more sliders yesterday than he did the first time we faced him or last time we faced him in Pittsburgh. And then skiing, same thing. Like he threw a lot more of his true change instead of the splitter. He threw a lot more of his true change tonight than he did when we saw him in Pittsburgh. 
And like when a guy makes that change, when you have a certain plan going into the game and the guy makes that change, you know, it, it's a good job by the pitcher to to adapt. I do think when you see a team back to back like that, when you get to see some of the bullpen arms that you might not see very frequently, I think that's an advantage for the hitter because you see those guys so infrequently now with the new schedule. That's what yeah. I was going to say. It's like even if you don't win a game, but you make their closer come in or their really high leverage guy come in. Um, and But in the more that you can get more guys to the plate and see him. So then, A, you know, if you can knock him out for the next day, but B, it's like, okay, we got him. So if he comes in again tomorrow or the next day, like, hey, you remember what, you know, instead of seeing somebody for the first time, like, okay, I know if his, you know, cutter starts here, like it's a ball, but if it starts here, it's a good one to hit. Where if this is the first time you're seeing them, you you might be you know out of luck. Where it's like, well, I I don't know. Yeah, like we I, faced we faced the guy in Pittsburgh at the end of one of those because we we played high scoring games when we were there and we saw a lot of their bullpen. But we faced one guy who came out of the pen and looked at the sheet and everything was kind of he was a righty. So when I was hitting lefty, everything was coming to me. It was cutter slider. He had a fastball, and he had a changeup. And a sinker. Sinker was 3%. Changeup was overall 8%, but showed up a little bit more with two strikes. So he threw me a first pitch slider down. I chased it. 0-1. Then he throws me a hip shot. So started at me. Sinker. 3% pitch. Hip shot sinker right on the corner. Took it. Go, oh my God, he's got a sinker. Because when it's on the bottom of the sheet like that, I'm like, he's not throwing that pitch. Sinker on the corner. And Especially he, to a lefty too, because like typically a right, use a righty. I'm yeah, obviously. Yeah, right. Uh, sinker typically doesn't play versus lefties unless you're able to hip shot it. Like yeah, so. and then I kind of I hadn't really thought much about the changeup because it was also low percentage, and I didn't make it all the way over to see where it ticks up with two strikes. So oh mm-hmm. two, and then he throws me a changeup, starts middle, and ends up in another batter's box. So he struck me on three pitches late in the game that was kind of a blowout, and I'm going like, who? What are we? Who is this guy? What are we doing? <laughs> Just threw me. I'm thinking everything that starts away is going to come to me, and he throws me multiple pitches that are the opposite of what I think is going to happen. And so then, when you get that situation, like if you see that guy in the next series, you have a okay. I see what I see. What this is going to look like. I see what this is going to do. Like I think that does. And we just faced we just faced Washington, and they had some young lefties who you hadn't I hadn't seen before. They got some young guys in the bullpen I haven't seen before. So. You you and we're gonna get them for four games later in the month, and you, you kind of bank that information for later and have a better idea of kind of what that's gonna look like. Do you ever, as a hitter, like you look at like the percentages, obviously, but let's say change up you struggle with a lot, but they throw it three percent of the time. Like, do you ever overthink it and think like, oh, but the pitcher knows I struggle with change up, so like he might throw me a change up, even though he hasn't thrown a lot. Like I don't see it well. So I do that. I, I do that, that a lot. I kind of like overthink it where I'm like, okay, if this guy throws, you know, predominantly sinker, has the four two. I ask this a lot too, because especially relievers, like they're gonna throw their best stuff. Like if 100%. they're in a pinch, they're gonna go to that opposed to the scouting report for the most part. You're like, mm-hmm. yeah, like if you know my nitro zone is down and in sinkers like okay probably going to stay away from that but like if his pitch is a sinker like hey okay we're just going to kind of stay away from that and set it up but i'll do that sometimes where i'm like well you know i thought that he was just going to come you know either straight at me or you know go fours instead of twos but it's like okay if i don't throw it as much like i'm going to get you out with my best stuff um i i wish I I actually ask that question a lot to pitchers if I get close enough with them. Like, hey, you know, when you come in, do you go more scouting report or do you more so go to your best stuff? I think a lot of it depends on, um, like, situation, obviously, of, like, if it's a big spot. I was always in the mindset of, like, if you're going to beat me, like, you're going to beat me hitting my best pitch. I'm not going to hang a spinny slider right down the middle and let you beat me that way. Like, if you hammer a four seam at the top of the zone, like, tip the cap. But it is, I feel like it's literally a case-by-case basis. Like, Kyle Hendricks, I think, just pitches, like, this is what the report says I should throw. That's what I'm going to throw. Um, and then there's other guys, like, I'm sure Skeens is like, I mean, I can just run 100 up there. Like, let's just throw that. Um, yeah. 
so that's another one of like getting a feel for a guy where it helps to see him a lot of like, okay, it says he throws 3% sliders, but he threw me four the last time I faced him. Like he's probably going to keep throwing me sliders. Yep. Yeah. I think some of it too is, is understanding the team or the catcher. Like sometimes over the course of a series, you'll get an understanding for like what the team's trying to do to you or like, Oh man, this team's throwing me a bunch more changeups, even if it's not the guy's best pitch or a high percentage pitch, like that's how they think they're going to get me out or, you know, this catcher's veteran. He's got experience. He's pitching off her port or how he thinks he's going to get me versus, you know, a younger catcher who's going directly off like what the pitching coach is trying to do or I know this because this guy's best pitch. Like there's a lot of that that goes back and forth. That's a really good point about the catcher because obviously like I know some guys call their own games, the pitchers, but like knowing the catcher even more, like Yasmani Grandal has been around the league forever. Like if he sees Ian Happ and he's like, oh, Ian Happ doesn't hit the changeup well. This guy doesn't throw a changeup a ton, but I think we can get him with it. Like he's going to know to go there versus like if it's a young guy on the mound, like they're just like, no, I just want to throw my best stuff. Um, So knowing the catcher, yeah, that's that's a really good point. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, we're like so if, you, we, if you've had a series and you're like, I dominated the fastball and then you play him again right away and it's like, well, they're going to throw first pitch spin. They're going to try to get ahead. They're going to try to throw more change-ups and like if you've done something against them previously maybe they're going to go with a different plan of attack salvi i'll never forget i think it was my second game that i played i never forget like i'm usually thinking with the pitcher pretty well um you know especially coming up from the minor leagues that this is my rookie year he had me like in a blender where i would expect one thing and it would just be a completely different pitch um and i remember that was the first time where i was like man like he has me just thinking about like three different pitches right now. Do you I mean guys the one like guess pitch, or do you kind of like think about like I think it's going to be this, but like ready to react to anything, or do you like keep nothing in your brain and just kind of like see it hit it? Shit, I, I wish I could have nothing in my brain and just. But you know, what I mean, like, I, I feel like there's all, three no, ways I know. I think it's it. like yeah. an educate. Yeah. I think it's an educated guess. Like yeah, and that's you know, where like guy, like if you, you take his top three pitches, right, Ian, like. You know, if it's forty five percent, and then you know the next few after that, like you're thinking, like, okay, he there's your top three pitches, like, okay, he hasn't thrown this in two or three pitches, like it could be coming here, depending on the situation. You know, like, hey, expect this tunnel out here, but you know, be ready to go if it's in. Um, I mean, but there's some guys who don't leave the fastball whatsoever, like, no matter what, and as soon as they see spin, you better hope, like they can shut it down or, you know, they're just going to swing and be like, yeah, I'm giving up on that. Like I, I got fooled. It is what it is. Yeah. And I think there's different pitchers, like understanding like, Hey, this guy likes to run to his spin with two strikes and like, is going to try to beat me under with spin, like to the earth and try to get me to swing over a breaking ball or a change up. Or like this guy likes to you know he'll throw some stuff during the bat it might be a fastball it might be a slider it might be but like he wants to finish with his fastball and like understanding like when i get to two strikes like i need to stay committed to the heater or like when i get to two strikes i really have to see it up and make sure that like if he throws spin it starts high enough that like where i can attack it versus like chasing it down i think having an understanding of like what the pitcher is going to try to do in those situations um but there are like there are certain pitchers who you either have to like, hey, this guy throws fours at the top with a change up down and away. Like I gotta commit to one or the other. Or there's guys that are like he throws a a, a fastball and a, a cutter and a slider and like everything's coming to me. So like if I'm on the four, then I can hit the cutter in the zone and then like you know, the slider might be the one I have to lay off. So there's some guys that you have to pick like one of two pitches or one of three pitches because they, they all are like move very differently. And there's some guys where you can be, I can be on one pitch and adapt to the others a little bit easier. With football season kicking off, it's the perfect time to dive into the action with our partners at DraftKings, the number one place to bet on touchdowns. You heard of them? Touchdown, six points. Right now, all new customers who bet just $5 instantly can get $250 in bonus bets plus one month of NFL Plus Premium. Now that's something 
we can all celebrate. That's $250 in bonus bets instantly and one month of NFL Plus Premium after betting just $5. Stay in on the action and use your $250 in bonus bets to bet anytime touchdowns on DraftKings, which is the place to bet touchdowns. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use promo code COMPOUND and bet just $5 on any wager and get $250 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code COMPOUND only at the DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 and over, age and eligibility varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. For additional terms and responsible gaming resources, see dkng.co slash ftball. NFL Plus Premium offer available only to new and former NFL Plus subscribers. Additional NFL Plus Premium terms at NFL.com slash terms. We were talking about bellies at bat tonight before we started, like 8, 9 pitch at bat. How much when you get into like 8, 9, 10 pitches in the at bat, is it just like a, all right, what's he going to do now? Like he threw me three straight heaters. Like say it's like a roll this Chapman, I feel like is the best example of like, all right, he's tried to blow me away with three straight heaters. Like when's he going to go to the slider or splitter? Like eventually he's got to switch it up. So is that kind of like, I feel like that's almost advantage pitcher. Like the later you get in the at bat, just because then the hitters like it's always adva- it's, o- it's always throw. advantage it's always yeah. advantage pitchers. yeah yes, you get, but, yeah. yeah you pitchers get four balls and we only get three strikes so you're you start with the lead there <laughs> yeah we need it man it's hard to throw strikes uh can I ask you guys one thing I've noticed with the Yankees this season and I can't tell if this is just perhaps the Yankees changing their approach or if this is more across baseball but I think it's a little bit more across baseball I've seen a lot more guys swinging on three o caps. Like I, I think it used to be on three and zero, pretty much guaranteed the guy wasn't going to swing. And now I, I don't know if it's analytics, maybe saying that that that's not the right approach to take. I'd be curious just to hear what your guys' thoughts. Like when you're I up three zero in the count, what is your approach? That's in at this time, unless you're Judge or somebody who is absolutely ridiculously on fire. Like that's the only real fastball count you have in today's game. So it's like if we have infield in and it's three zero with the guy on first and third, like I'm going to give, if I'm a manager, like I'll give probably 95% of everybody green light, like go get them, come out of your shoes. Like that might be the only pitch that you're looking for that you're going to get that at bat. It is crazy that, like you said, in today's game, like two Oh is not really a fastball count anymore. Like that is any Dude, pitch they I, have could be thrown three Oh tonight. We were facing this kid. He has a bunch of pitches. He threw me like a front hip cutter 3-0. And like I was getting ready to walk to first, like as it was coming in. I'm like, oh, that's in. And I was like, oh, okay. 3 0 cutter, like <laughs> sick. I mean, there's there's definitely power. there's definitely guys now that command their off speed better than their fastballs. Like there's guys that run to a slider or a cutter with in a 2 0 count because it's the pitch they can command best. And it really is the only fastball count like pure fastball count left. Like it used to be two Oh three one. Like you're getting a heater, you're getting a sinker. Maybe they're still going to try to locate it, but like that's the pitch that's coming. And that doesn't exist anymore. We faced guys in the last couple of weeks that are, you know, 50% fastball, but in batter ahead counts. So two Oh three one, it flips to 60% off speed. And like, because, they're going to pitch ahead with the four. And then if they get behind, they're going to flip a slider in there to get back in the count back to the four like that. It's just, yeah. Analytically it, it's, I think that's why so many guys are like three Oh, I'm actually going to get a fastball. Like I'm going to go get it. And the amount of damage that can be done in those situations is huge. And like, if you foul it off, like now what, now what's he going to try to do? Like I just took my a swing on a fastball. Like he's going to try to locate a slider three, one, like good luck. Zach, I feel like you would have done this as well. I just remember like pitching and there'd be so many times where I'm like, he thinks I'm going to throw a slider here. So I'm going to throw this or like, he thinks I'm going to do this. So I'm not going to do that. Like I could just see you in the box being like, he thinks I'm sitting slider, but I'm actually sitting heater. 
No. I think, again, it just kind of, it, it goes back to just like the educated guess. Um, yeah. Not that you ever know, but it's. No, yeah. right. But like, I'm a pretty patient um, hitter in general. So like a lot of teams will flip breaking balls in early. And, you know, in some situations, they'll be like, all right, like we've done it the first two at bats. Like now we have a guy in second, like, OK, let's go to a different plan now. Um and then, you know, you're up there thinking like, all right, he's done it the last two at-bats. Like, all right, I'm going to think, you know, he's going to come soft or whatever. And then, you know, but yeah, I mean, you're in there. You're thinking like, okay, he knows that I know that he threw it the last two at-bats. Like, hey, they might have to go to a different plan here. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's just such a cat and mouse game the whole game, no matter what. How often – I feel like you especially, like, picturing your at-bats, not you especially, but like you and Ian – um, how often do you walk up and like auto take or like ready to swing on the very first pitch? Like first pitch of the bat. I feel like you are sometimes someone that like is like, I'm taking this pitch. Yeah, I'm too passive. I'm definitely yeah. too passive. Um like do you go up there thinking like I'm not swinging, or is it just kind of like it's it's just all game plan situation, really. Yeah. Like Ian Ian would agree. Like there's some times where you just can't swing first pitch and then there's other times where it's like hey come unglued if it's there and if it's not whatever it's yeah it's pretty rare that i'm like auto taking auto taking like maybe i'm just like all over the heater and so if they flip me spin i'm shutting down but like pretty rare i'm auto taking auto taking but when the question you asked earlier about thinking along with the catcher like in our division with the new balance schedule it's a little bit different because you're playing so many teams and you don't really like have a feel for the way catchers call games but the one guy that I did try to play the game with was Yachty because he had been back there for so long and so much experience. We had played so many games against them. It was like, that was the one guy that was like, he's going to do the double reverse. He's going to, he's thinking that I'm thinking and I'm thinking yeah. that he's thinking and he's going to triple reverse me here. He's going to, he, he knows that I want to hit a fastball. And so he's going to throw a curveball. But because he knows that he knows that I know, Maybe he's going back to the fastball. That was the one guy that I, was, like, here's, I, think I feel like I would like really try to think along with. Yeah. I feel like Yachty's the guy that like didn't have these thoughts. He's just like, oh, this guy's not hitting a slider. Like he didn't even think twice about it. He's just like, nah. He would set another... you up though. He would do he would do stuff where he would like nobody on base. They would they would come at you aggressive and they would get you to a place where like, all right, we come at you aggressive with nobody on base and then Maybe you maybe you hit a, a rocket on a fastball, and then so you think that he's going to go off speed first pitch the next at bat, and then he sticks that same pitch that you just hit a homer on right back at you, and you're like, God, I was, <laughs> I didn't think you were going to do that. Like he he was the guy that would really, you know, sometimes felt like he was one step ahead of you with the way they were game calling, and you would get four at bats into the game, and he would. He would have done, you know, the same thing until there was a runner scoring position. And then he goes a completely different plan. Like he he was really good with the way that he would, you know, think through, you know, the way the hitter and he he would look at you as he was giving signs too. And yeah. he would like he would just like look up at you. Like I would I would do the thing where I would like get in the box and tap the plate and he'd just be looking at me, just waiting for me to turn my head and give the sign. Another cool thing what catchers yeah. do, um, and, you know, next time you're watching a game, see if they'll do it. Like, I feel like somebody like Trevino would would be good at it. Like, if he's calling pickoff, right, uh, when the pitch comma or whatever and gets it, he'll set up sometimes. So, like, say he wants to throw off speed next pitch and he knows that he's picking over this pitch, like, he'll set up, like, way, way in off the plate. So then if you turn around as a hitter, like you're like, all right, he's right there. And then, you know, so in your head, you're like, all right, if he's set up way in, it's probably going to be something hard. And then, you know, it's kind of, again, that cat and, cat and mouse game where um, there it's just always trying to get into somebody's head the whole time. Yeah, guys will make it, guys will make a noise, like brush, like they'll like, they'll like brush the dirt, like close to you yeah. when they're going change up away and are like, there are like all kinds of little things that guys do. Like the classic glove time. tap down and away and they're actually yeah. going like sinker in. <laughs> yeah. If I hear chest. that now, like I almost throw it away and I'm like, 
There's if, it's gotta be if you're doing that and you're saying like, hey, throw it here, and you actually do, like, I'm gonna turn around, and be like, what are you doing? Don't do that. <laughs> they need the visual. Come on, makes it yeah. easier. I mean, give me that target down there. How about uh, all right? <laughs> keep that part in. Keep the all right. And <laughs> I mean, what do we got on Ben Joyce throwing? I'm saying I'm rounding up to 106. No, Speaking we don't that. round up. We do not round up. Not when you get to that yeah, higher I, number. Exit velos. I'm rounding up. What was thing it? Says, first no, of all, not. first of all, One, two, yeah, two things. Two things. Is that a drive line thing? No rounding up? Or are we like no rounding yeah. up? Yes, and I also always I think look it's like a pitcher that. thing. Put it this way: quick little taste. I hit 97 nine. I didn't hit 98. So I can't say that I threw 98 because I did not. I threw ninety seven points. I mean, Ian, if you hit a ball, if you hit a ball one oh seven nine, that's one oh eight, bro. That's if you hit one oh seven point nine, it's one oh eight, brother. No, and it's if not. I and I want you to know that if if a, a pitcher throws me a ball that's ninety nine five, I just turned around a hundred. The yes, reason 100%. the reason I say no to that is say the the record is one oh six point two or one oh six point six, and then someone else gets one oh six point eight, like they both got one oh seven, so they're tied. In my book, if I did it, yeah, That's, I one you don't believe that. No way. 100% I do. Zach, what, what was the velo? I haven't seen this. 105.5. His first two pitches were 86, 86, 105.5. Was that a three-pitch punch? I believe so. Like slider, 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 here's 105 and a half for your bush? Here's the you perfect betcha. example. Who Who has thrown the hardest pitch in baseball? Because... Ben Joyce has thrown it at 105.5. Aroles Chapman is 105.8. So are they tied at 106? I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. You're you're right. When you get when you get to that level, you're not you you need the decimals. Yeah. Wait, it says Ben Joyce is the fastest pitch in the pitch tracking era. When is the pitch tracking era? Because Aroles Chapman oh, had 105.8 in 2010. This says this says 2008. Well. Rolls Chapman's got 105.8 per Google, and Google doesn't lie. Never has, never will. Either way, still, that's noise. It's throwing the ball hard. That's that's pretty, uh, that's exactly. some pretty exceptional speed. I mean, we've, we've been seeing some hunch balls, and 5.5 five is, that's, di- that's, I mean, that's the difference between 95 and 100, or 96 and 100. It's absurd. But we don't round up. But we don't round up in this game. Danny Mueller's hot take. Chocolate isn't candy. We were on the plane, and he was eating a crunch bar. And I said, isn't that candy? And he said, no, it's a chocolate bar. It's different. But Sour Patch Kids are candy, but uh, like a Hershey's chocolate bar is not candy. It's chocolate. You know what the craziest part about that statement is? Is that it's called a Hershey's candy bar. It That's what I has said. the word candy in it. I said, wouldn't you consider that a candy bar? He said, nope. Nope. Absolutely not. That's just that's just inherently wrong. That's just wrong. Hershey Park is one of my favorite places growing up as a kid. I would go all the time in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Happy you ever go as a Pennsylvania guy? You no, ever never Park? went. Never went. Oh, Zach, Zach left. Zach's us. gone. He's had enough. But as Dakota pointed out, famously, Hershey does make chocolate, but they also make plenty of other kinds of candy. So in, in Dan's mind, is there like a factory and then there's only a factory for chocolate and then everything else is at the candy factory? I don't really yeah, they keep it separate. Well, my I... question to him, my question to him was, hey, is a Snickers bar candy bar? And he said, yeah. I said, well, what's the difference? He said, there's other stuff in it. Oh, so it's the adding of another element that makes it a candy bar. But technically, a crunch bar That's does have like say. the... The Rice Krispies in it, so that would be adding an element. This that's, his arguments on weak ground, I would say. That's what I said. And if you don't consider chocolate candy, uh, I mean, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's all one family. It's all like when you go trick or treating, they're putting chocolate bars in there. They're putting Sour Patch Kids and lollipops. Like it's all the same. Zach's playing this fun game where he just yeah. goes, he just, he just leaves and comes back and leaves and comes back. He's not going to participate in this hot take. That's not even like we said, that's not even like a hot take though. That's just like a wrong take. Like I think he just, I think he wrong. just does it to make himself feel better about his chocolate consumption. He's like, oh, I didn't eat candy. I ate chocolate. 
that seems like someone in Danny's life is like, you have to stop eating candy. And he's found the loophole of being like, I can have chocolate. So that's not candy. Yeah. You know where I, I agree with him on that? Because I eat butter pecan ice cream. And you know what I'm eating? I'm eating walnuts or pecans. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Whoa. Oh, no. That's wait, time, <laughs> out. time out. It's in the name. It's in the name. No, 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 well, no. here's why I said that is because I didn't want to say I eat the nuts. That didn't seem appropriate. So I tried to name that, the nut in there, and it is and a. You got it completely and totally pecan. wrong. That's you say the pecan or pecan? Decision? Butter pecan is my favorite ice cream. People at work call me Butters because I told someone that, so they now call me Butters. That's a good nickname. Yeah, I love it, and I it's my favorite ice cream. Second favorite, mint chocolate chip. Those are my hot takes. I love them both. I got butter pecan in the freezer right now. You want me to eat it? I'll eat it live on the show. I. I think you're the first person under the age of 75 to have butter pecan ice cream. And that feels like the most grandmother coated dessert out there. No, I think like Neapolitan is that. But yes, I see your point. But butter pecan is unreal. I want you to know that that ice cream sounds horrible. Do you also like like the Werther's originals? Do you like like the like the the, 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 those like old people candies, you know, like the caramels or whatever? That feels like that's like the same thing. No. I Toss don't know a couple if of those Zach in your butter pecan on anyone ice else's cream. screen, but we're talking about my ice cream take, and his screen is frozen on mine to him just sitting here like this. So he looks super disappointed in my take. That's he's just living like that now because of your yeah. <laughs> your ice cream take. Have you had butter pecan ice cream in? No. I need sound. you to try it. You can't knock it if you haven't had it. Doesn't sound appetizing at all. Let's get the people to Sloan screen time. Zach's on and off. We'll see if we can get his screen time. Sloan is the world's leading manufacturer of commercial plumbing systems. The company's at the forefront of the green building movement and provides smart, sustainable, and hygienic restroom solutions by manufacturing water efficient products, including flush meters, faucets, sink systems, soap dispensers, and fixtures for commercial, industrial, and institutional markets worldwide. To learn more, visit Sloan.com. Please give me your Sloan screen times. 351. Nice job. Not a bad day. Not a bad day. I had a bad day. How? You had a game. It was was morning. morning. I wasn't monitoring my screen time before the uh what was Dakota's answer? Dakota, what was your answer? 351. (laughs) Had a good day. Felt like I was in the running today. Uh four hours, 27 minutes. 439 for me. 439. I hope Zach is higher That's, so that I'm not the worst. That is a bad day for you. Though, yeah, it was a bad, tough day. Especially on social, too. What are we doing? I, I spent too much time on the on the phone today. On the old that, TikTok? That was my fault. I'll say it. I've deleted Twitter off my phone, and my life's improved a lot. I'm just saying this to anyone out there. If you're thinking about doing it, I can't recommend it enough. That's just where I get my news, though. I wouldn't know what's going on in the world without it. Yeah, but do you really know what's going on in the world to begin with? I wouldn't even know, like, Ricky Pearsall got shot. 49ers player. I wouldn't have known that without Twitter. How would I know that? Who would just word of mouth? Hey, Zach, welcome back. You want to tell the people your screen time? Yeah, I told you I was toast. Um, mine thing, my thing says four minutes. Okay, good, man. Oh, Thanks for coming back to give convenient. us that. Thanks. We appreciate it. Tom's going to have you're so much gross. fun editing you, bouncing in and out. It's, you're just going to be... Man, it's not my fault. You know the you know the thing on the screen, the DVD video that never hits the corner that just bounces around. That's going to be you was, on the screen for the last ten minutes of the episode. So thanks for that. <laughs> Pretty sure you guys yelled at Dakota for freezing before, so I'm not the only one here. Why are you throwing me under the bus? Did you even bring I'm not word? the only one that's getting hit by this anything. bus. Did I'm you not bring the anything? only one. I have good Wi-Fi. Good for me. Did you? Yeah, Tom, congrats, you too. Great job today, Tom. You killed it, man. Hey, Zach, did you bring your microphone on the road? Yes, I'm on my phone right now. I know, I'm just wondering, because you had some audio issues earlier, too. That was because I was using a different computer, because mine wasn't on yet. All right, <laughs> awesome, man. Hey, that's episode uh, 223 of the Compound Podcast, written by Parse Rum. Go to Benny's, get your Parse. When you're there, tell them the Compound sent you, and tell them that Zach doesn't have good Wi-Fi. We will see you next week. And Dakota. What am I, I? It's not my Wi-Fi. It's Tom's. I was not frozen on your screen. Oh, so now you're now you're throwing under Tom. <laughs> That's a good point. I'll take some responsibility for a bad Wi-Fi. See you next week. <laughs>